hormones, right? You either love them or you hate them. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the ATIT's version seven human anatomy and physiology portion of the exam. And we're gonna be focusing on the endocrine system. Let's get started. The endocrine system is composed of various structures that release hormones, which can occur at the individual cell level or the entire organ. So starting at the top, when it comes to our brain, we have the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, and the pituitary gland. Moving down to our neck, we have the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland. Further down into our chest, we have the thymus gland. Positioned right above our kidneys, we have the adrenal gland. And right next to our stomach, we have the pancreas. And then lastly, we have our gonads, which are the reproductive glands. We can have ovaries and females, and we have testes and males. So let's highlight two key points when we discuss these different kinds of glands. Firstly, our focus here is going to be primarily on the endocrine function of these glands, not the exocrine function. So what's the difference? Endocrine glands release hormones directly into their surrounding environment, like blood vessels, without the need of actually having to have ducts. Conversely, exocrine glands have to have ducts in order to transport those secretions to the body's surfaces and cavities. Think of things like sweat glands, mammary glands, which produce milk. These kind of glands are exocrine glands. There's a great memory trick when it comes to remembering the differences between these two types of glands. When it comes to endocrine, I like to think of the EN and endocrine and the EN and enter, which means that endocrine glands secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. They enter their internal environment. Whereas the EX in exocrine and the EX in exit lets us know that exocrine glands use ducts to transport these secretions out of the gland and either onto the surface of our body or our body cavities. What's really interesting is that some glands like we see with our pancreas have both endocrine and exocrine functions. For example, its endocrine activity involves releasing insulin and glucagon to manage blood sugar levels, while its exocrine function involves secreting digestive enzymes through ducts into the small intestine. And secondly, while we've covered major endocrine glands, it's important to recognize that endocrine functions can also be found in cells within other organs. Let's take the stomach, for example. In our discussion about the digestive system, we discussed that enzymes in hydrochloric acid and gastric juices, but we never mentioned gastrin, which is a hormone that facilitates the secretion of stomach acid. Gastrin is produced by specific cells found within our stomach, showing how widespread endocrine activities can be found throughout the body. Let's move on to the role of hormones. It's important to understand that hormones can come from various biomolecules. Some of these can be derived from amino acids or chains of amino acids known as polypeptides, and some may be derived from lipids such as steroids. The composition of a hormone significantly impacts its function, including the specific receptor sites that are going to bind to targeted cells. Once bound, hormones are going to trigger these cells to perform specific actions, such as accelerating mitosis or activating certain enzymes. Given the diverse responses of targeted cells, we'll revisit the glands and explore some of the major hormones associated with each one, outlining their general functions. This will give us a clearer picture of how hormones influence bodily processes. So starting in the brain, the hypothalamus pituitary region acts as a central command overseeing much of the endocrine system. The pituitary gland is divided into two parts. We have the interior pituitary, which is more towards the front, and the posterior pituitary, which is more towards the back, both of which branch off from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus produces several hormones, which the posterior pituitary stores and later releases. What's really cool is that unlike its counterpart, our posterior pituitary does not produce its own hormones. Instead, it secretes hormones like oxytocin, which is crucial for uterine contractions during childbirth, and antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH, which promotes the kidneys to reabsorb water. The anterior pituitary, however, is a hormone powerhouse. It's capable of producing its own hormones while still being tightly regulated by the hypothalamus. Some of the key hormones you're going to see is growth hormone, which you might have guessed promotes growth. Prolactin, also known as PRL, stimulates milk production in the mammary glands. 
thyroid stimulating hormone, which activates the thyroid to release thyroid hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates the formation of the ova and sperm, luteinizing hormone produces ovulation and androgens respectfully. And lastly, we have the adrenocorticotropic hormone, also known as ACTH, which drives the adrenal cortex to release various hormones like cortisol. Here are some easy ways to help you remember these different kinds of hormones. Remember oxytocin when it comes to obstetrics, as this helps with the uterine contractions during childbirth. When you think of ADH, think of the D as you can't pee, since it helps the body retain water by preventing diuresis, also known as urination. When it comes to growth hormone, I like to think of GH standing for grow high as it focuses on promoting body growth. The PRL, when it comes to prolactin, stands for produce real lactation because it stimulates milk production. The TSH and thyroid stimulating hormone stands for thyroid secretion helper as it stimulates the thyroid to release thyroid hormones. The FSH and follicle stimulating hormone stands for follicle selection hormone since it stimulates the gonads to produce gametes. The LH and luteinizing hormone stands for luteal phase hormone because it plays a critical role in menstruation and ovulation. And then lastly, the ACTH stands for adrenal cortex triggering hormone because it stimulates the adrenal cortex to release various hormones. It's important not to overlook the small yet mighty pineal gland. Despite its size, it plays a significant role by secreting melatonin, which is key in regulating our circadian rhythm. That's the natural cycle that influences our sleep wake cycle. Next up, we have the thyroid gland, which is that butterfly shaped gland that nestles beneath the larynx and encircles the trachea in the front. This gland produces T4 and T3 hormones, which are pivotal in regulating metabolic processes. Additionally, the thyroid gland secretes calcitonin, which is a hormone that helps reduce our blood calcium levels. The parathyroid gland is located at the back or posterior position relative to the thyroid gland. And this particular gland is going to secrete something known as parathyroid hormone, which plays a critical role in increasing our blood calcium levels. So why is calcium so important? Calcium plays a vital role in nerve transmission and muscle function, including the proper functioning of the heart muscle. It's also essential when it comes to blood clotting processes and helps regulate enzyme activity and hormone secretion. There are some easy ways to remember the functions of T4, T3, calcitonin, and parathyroid hormone. I like to think of the T and T4 and T3 as standing for thyroid, and the numbers four and three indicate the number of iodon molecules each contains. Both of these hormones are crucial for turning up the body's metabolic rate, like turning up the heat to make things go faster. When it comes to calcitonin, I like to remember it as calcitonin it down because it helps lower the levels of calcium that are found in our blood when they're too high. And with parathyroid hormone, you can think of it as parathyroid pushes it up, meaning that it's going to increase those calcium levels in our blood when we don't have enough. So next, let's focus on our thymus gland. What's interesting is that some endocrine diagrams might leave out the thymus, possibly because it diminishes inside as a person matures into adulthood. However, as a gland, the thymus produces hormones that influence immune function, also known as thymosin. Thymosin is particularly important because it stimulates the production of our T cells, which are key players in the immune response. An easy way to remember thymosin is thymus stimulate immunity. This mnemonic helps link thymosin in its crucial role when it comes to our immune system. Next up, let's examine the adrenal glands, which are situated right here above our kidney. These glands are comprised of two distinct parts. We have the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla secretes two things. It secretes epinephrine, and norepinephrine, which are hormones that are crucial for initiating the fight or flight response that we see in our body during stress. Epinephrine primarily influences the heart, while norepinephrine works primarily on our blood vessels. I like to remember this with a mnemonic epi no rush, meaning that epi stands for epinephrine, no stands for norepinephrine, as it's essential for it to rush 
or burst out of energy needed for that fight or flight response. Moving on to the adrenal cortex, it produces something known as glycocorticosteroids, with cortisol being its primary example. Cortisol helps increase blood glucose levels and plays significant roles in managing stress and reducing inflammation. Additionally, the adrenal cortex secretes mineral corticosteroids, such as aldosterone, which is essential for balancing electrolytes in the body. Aldosterone, for example, helps regulate sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion in the nephrons of the kidney. Some tips and ways that I'd like to remember these is that cortisol controls stress because it helps manage stress and inflammation. And for aldosterone, I like to think of Aldo stores NA, where the Aldo stands for aldosterone because it stores sodium, which is our NA, inside of our body. Next up, the pancreas plays a crucial role in managing the body's glucose levels. After we eat, glucose, which is a type of sugar, enters our bloodstream. Insulin, which is a hormone produced by our pancreas, is going to signal the body's cells to absorb the glucose. Without insulin, cells cannot access glucose they need for energy, which is why many individuals with diabetes may need to take insulin injections if their pancreas isn't functioning appropriately. Additionally, the pancreas produces glycogon, another important hormone that helps increase blood glucose levels by promoting the liver to convert its stored glycogen into glucose, ensuring that the body maintains a balanced energy supply. With insulin, think insulin puts sugar in. Insulin is key when it comes to letting glucose enter the cells. This mnemonic emphasizes that insulin's primary role to lower blood sugar levels by facilitating glucose entry into the cells. And with glucagon, I want you to think of glucagon raises glucose. Remember, glucagon is the hormone that gets glucose going by raising blood sugar levels. And of course, as we know, it does this by signaling the liver to release glucose into the bloodstream. And then lastly, we're going to discuss our gonads, that is our ovaries and our testes. The ovaries produce estrogen, which primarily promotes the growth of the uterine lining and the development of female secondary sex characteristics. Additionally, the ovaries produce progesterone, which not only supports, but also maintains that uterine lining growth and helps play a pivotal role in fetal development during pregnancy. On the other hand, testes produce androgens, also known as testosterone, which is essential for sperm production and the development of male secondary sex characteristics. It's important to note that while estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are present in all individuals, these hormone concentrations and primary functions are going to vary. Typically, estrogen and progesterone are found in higher levels and play more significant roles in females, whereas androgens like testosterone are more concentrated and predominantly function in males. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding everything you need to know when it comes to the endocrine system for the T's. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there is a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace those ATIT's exams. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!